the Red Boiling Springs Church will be providing food. The funeral will be tomorrow at 1 at uh, RBS. They will go to the burial place at Anderson and Lafayette. Then immediately after that, they will eat there. So if you would like to bring food or you'd like to come eat with a family, you can do that uh, tomorrow evening. And I told her I would have that announced. Was, did we announce that? Okay. Sometimes I don't get to hear all the announcements because my mind is somewhere else. Uh, especially with all of the comments that I've had about my birthday today. I've been uh, guest anywhere from the age of 39 to 72. And so that's a pretty long, uh, wide span there, but uh, nevertheless, I'm just glad to have another one. And I hope you get to have another one. That's what life's all about. Appreciate you being back tonight. If you will, turn to John chapter 2. Uh, my wife said, I've never heard a sermon on John chapter 2, never heard me preach on it. And I said, well, you're going to hear it tonight. I've been working on this, and I'm, I hope that you will enjoy it. I have entitled it, Jesus Cleanses the Temple, beginning with verse number 13, John 2. The Bible says, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when He had made a scourge of small cords, He drove them out of, of the temple and the sheep, and the oxen, and he poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, Psalm 69, 9, The zeal of thy house has eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Then, Jesus, the, then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. And when he therefore, when therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the Scripture and the word which Jesus had said. There were several events in the life of Jesus that turned the Jewish religious leaders against Jesus. One of them was, of course, his claims that he being the Christ, that he be the Messiah, the Son of God, they couldn't hardly accept that. And then here Jesus is healing a man on the Sabbath day. And man, that got their dandruff up. Boy, they were upset at Jesus. And on and on and on. The refusal of Jesus to obey the tradition of the Pharisees made Him cross with the Pharisees. And there were so, several other events that caused the wrath of the Jews upon Jesus. One of them being, there were two cleansing of the temples. One here in John 2, and the other one was later on, later in Matthew. But what we're going to focus on, early in His ministry, we want to look at some things uh, that in this event that I believe is very pertinent to our understanding not only who Jesus was and is, but to show how He had power and He had authority. Now notice first of all, as we go through this, I want you to notice in John 2 and verse number 13, you will notice, and the Jews' Passover was at hand. The Jews' Passover was at hand. Now you know through our Wednesday night study that this was on the 14th day of the month of Abib. You know uh, that this was a, a feast day that was to take place on the 14th day by all the Jews and the Passover lamb would be slain and it would be eaten with bre uh, unleavened bread and these herbs. This feast, whole feast week was known as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Every Jew would come to Jerusalem for this feast day. There were three major feast days, this being one of them. Now, we know 
if you look at the second one, well, let's go back to this. I, there's a point I want to make. I want you to look at the second part of verse 13. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Not only did the Jews go, but He went up to Jerusalem. Why? Because Galatians 4, verse 4 says, Jesus was born under the law. Born of a woman under the law. Jesus lived and died under the law of Moses. What did the law state? Exodus 12, all the way through uh, the rest of the Old Testament, it was common practice and a command that the Jews would go to Jer- up to Jerusalem to worship, and Jesus being a devout Jew, He being one that honored the law, He went up there to practice this also. Here is the Son of God. He sees j- these Jews going up to worship. He realizes that He too ought to go, must go, and He goes up to worship as was a practice and a command. Now, I want you to notice, look at the corruption within the temple. What did He find? And He found, watch this now, He found in the temple those that sold oxen and those that sold sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. According to Deuteronomy 14, verses 23 through 26, this was not against the law. As a matter of fact, as the practice was, they would travel many, many miles to go to Jerusalem to worship. It was almost impossible for them to bring their own animals from their own herds. So according to Deuteronomy 14, verses 23 through 26, they could purchase them in Jerusalem. And they were doing that. They could exchange money uh, with those who lived in places that had different monetary systems. Sadly, the temple had become a place of extortion. High prices were charged for animals. We call it gouging. Not only that, there was a high exchange rate that was being charged to these Jews that would travel in uh, to worship. They were using what I call a legal form of theft to make a great profit. So here's the situation. Jesus as all the Jews are up there to worship, and when Jesus gets in there, He sees the money changers, He sees the oxen, He sees the animals, and uh, that brings us to the cleansing of the temple. In John 2, 15-17, And when He had made a scourge of small cords, now watch this, I like what He says here, He drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep, now we're not talking about inside the temple, we're talking about probably in the outer court. And he drove them out, he drove the sheep out, he drove the oxen out, he poured out the changers' money, he overthrew the tables, and he said to, uh, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, Psalm 69, 9, The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Jesus saw the dishonesty. He saw the evil practices that, were going, that was going on. And the Bible says, in one translation it says, and He was filled with righteous indignation. It upset Jesus that in this temple area, or right before you get in to go to worship, they had set up, they were taking advantages of the poor people, they had to travel a great distance to get there, the money changers were charging high interest rates or high rates of exchange, and it upset Jesus. It upset Jesus. What we want to look at tonight, and especially uh, the next point, is it wrong to be filled with righteous indignation? Is it wrong when you see a movement or when you see and you hear something going on that is totally wrong, does it it not cause you to be angry just like it did Jesus? Now, I want you to notice, this is where I call what we call the cleansing of the temple. Then you get to the flushing. Let's look at the flushing of what I call the flushing of the temple. What do I mean by that? He fashioned a small wheel of small cords and he got that thing together and he drove out. Somebody, I heard a, when I was in preaching school, one, I remember a guy that was dealing with this. and He said, I could just see him 
He, he'd be, sort of be like Tarzan coming in and wiping out a whole village. Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily describe him like, that way. But what he is doing, he's taking a small uh, cord, he poured out uh, the money changers. The money, went, no doubt, went everywhere. He drove out all the animals. He got rid of the money changers. And I ask a question, was Jesus angry? Yes. But did Jesus sin? No. Ephesians 4 verse 26 says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun come down on thy wrath. There is nothing wrong with anger as long as it is a controlled anger and that anger doesn't move you to saying and doing something that is ungodly and uh, displeasing to the Lord. So here is the situation. You've got the flushing. He sees it. He realizes what's taking place. He's there for the purpose of worship. They're there supposed to be in there in the, the house of God for worship. And he sees this and he flushes them out. Why? Because verse 16, you see the forbiddance of uh, Jesus. Jesus did not remain silent on this particular occasion. Look at verse 16. He said, take these things hence. Look at the two commands. You take them and you get out of here. And number two... You do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. The forbidden. You can't be in here and do what you're doing. Jesus plainly reveals that the Jews were in violation of the purpose of the house of God. What was the house of God supposed to be used for? Worship. Sometimes I almost think in my mind, that some brethren have made the house of God a house of merchandise. We were traveling on vacation one time years ago, and I remember us going to this particular congregation, and there was a man there raising funds for a particular uh, mission work, and he was selling things. He said, okay, this one right here, if you buy this, he said... Uh, this will be $30, or if you want to make, give more money for that. And he said, all of that will go in to, uh, to, to promote to, and to help this particular mission work. I won't mention the name or the work. And so he started, I, I noticed in the whole congregation, people shaking their hand, they looking at it, they didn't think, uh, shaking their heads, they didn't think that that was right. And I didn't see anybody buying anything. And I was, one of the elders talked to me later, and he found out I was in mission work. He said, do y'all you all sell and do y'all do that? Never. Never. That's not the way the Lord's church raises money. Now, I understand this was under the old law. This was permissible according to the book of Deuteronomy, but God never intended in the old law for people to take advantage of other people when it came to uh, selling animals, a fair price would have been okay. The exchange rate should have been fair. But no, they were taking advantage of it. He says, the house of God, you've made it a den of thieves. Friends, when we come into the house of God, the church, the assembly, we come here for one purpose. And that is to worship our God who is so worthy of our worship. These people have forgot what it's all about. There have been churches turned in for profit corporations. We're not in the, the money-making business. We're not piling up a bunch of money to draw interest. We're not trying to buy up property just to hoard up property because we don't have to. I don't know whether the church has to pay land taxes. Well, whatever. But that's not the purpose of the local congregation. That wasn't the purpose of what was allowed in the old law in Deuteronomy when they were taking advantage of the situation. So... What does Jesus do? He forbids them to do that. And number three, you see the fulfillment of Scripture. And His disciples remembered. wonder why they remembered. They knew what the old law said. And the old law said in Psalm 69, 9, The zeal of thy house hath eaten me up. Now I want you to look at the word zeal. The word zeal there literally means to burn or to be passionate about. So what Jesus is saying, in, uh, He said this is a fulfillment of that Scripture. This is what had been foretold that would happen. That what sign, uh, this zeal of thine house has eaten me up. 
The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. What? Man, you've been, you ought to be burning with passion. This is a fulfillment of what uh, Psalm 69.9 says. This is go- actually going to happen. So then you have what I call the clash. You have the cleansing. Then you have the clash. What is the clash? Look at verse 18. You don't even have to get out of the book of John. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that you do these things? If you're going to use this kind of authority in the temple, you're going to have to prove to us that you have that kind of authority. What what are you doing acting like that anyway? They demanded a sign. It reminds me of what 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22 says, For the Jews demand a sign, and the Gentiles demanded wisdom. So the Jews wanted a sign. And had I been there, I'd have probably been the same thing. Hey, this is allowed in the old law. We, you could do that. You could buy and you could sell there in the outer part of the temple area. This was permissible. But what they had done was abuse the law, taking advantage of people, and it upset Jesus. And what you have is this clash between He and the religious leaders. You don't have the right to do that. You don't have the authority to, oh yes, He does. So, here's the confusion. Verses 19-21, through 21, Jesus said to them, Destroy the temple, in three days I will raise it up. They're always thinking physical. Verse 20, Then said the Jews, Forty and six years, was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. So here is the confusion. They thought he was talking about his physical body. Jesus is not talking about his physical body. As a matter of fact, I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 26, and I want to show you something later on in the life of Jesus that this statement is used against Jesus on his, in his uh, trial. Look at John... Um, Matthew 26, 16, 61. But the chief priest, verse 59, but the chief priest and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. They're trying to find somebody to come forth and say, hey, we need somebody to testify against him. It doesn't matter if you're lying. We just need some evidence. We need somebody to testify. Verse 60, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. And at last came two false witnesses. And this is what they said, verse 61. This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. You see that? Matthew 27 and verse 40, basically the same thing. Here's the accusation. This man said, that you destroy this beautiful temple and He can build it back in three days. Well, absolutely He can build it back in three days. He is telling the truth. There's no doubt about it. Our Lord said, you destroy the temple and I will build it back in three days. Total confusion. Friends, it's hard when people are thinking in the physical realm to get them to think in the spiritual realm. Let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. When Jesus met Nicodemus, Nicodemus said, Rabbi, I know no man can do these things, do these miracles, except he be from God. And Jesus said, well, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, well, how can I enter my mother's womb the second time? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. And Jesus said in John 3 and in verse 5, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. The Jews in that day, Nicodemus in that day, was thinking in the physical realm. Jesus said, you must be born of the water and the Spirit. People sometimes don't understand Jesus because they don't understand that He's concerned about their soul and about spiritual teaching and not necessarily physical teaching. They didn't understand that. So what do you have? You have the confirmation. Look at verse 22. When therefore He was risen from the dead, His disciples remembered that He had said unto them. And they believed the Scripture and the Word which Jesus had said. Do do you see the confirmation? In John 12 and verse 16, let's look at what John said about this very thing or records for us. In John 12 and verse 16, 
These things understood not His disciples at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of Him, that they had done the things unto Him. In other words, they had time to think about it. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, these disciples started putting two and two together. They didn't, this no way diminished the truth of what Jesus is saying. You destroy this body, on the third day it's going to raise. I'm going to raise it up because He's part of deity. He's part of the Godhead. And even though He's in the tomb, on the third day He's going to come. They didn't understand that. The point that I want us to make and take from this lesson tonight is this. We see the abuse of people that were religious folks. Number two, what we see here is the anger of Jesus. And number three, we see a fulfillment of Scripture. Because Jesus has said, you destroy this temple and I'll build it back. And later on, He said, now this was that which I talked about. He raised His body on the third day from the tomb. Isn't that interesting how that Jesus cleanses the temple and there was confusion, there was class between uh, the people, there was uh, the confirmation that Jesus said, you want a sign? The sign is that one day this body right here is going to be raised from the dead. And you know they remembered what Jesus had said. He taught them that I'm going to do this. You destroy the body, I'll raise it back up. That's not going to be the end of me. And sure enough, they remembered what He said. Friends, when I look at the story in John 2 about Jesus cleansing the temple, in all of my years of preaching, I'd never really done a, a, an expository sermon of this particular event. But what I have learned and what I, I think is so interesting is that Jesus did the right thing he never backed down from those that had an ulterior motive or that was in error. He made sure he did the right thing. Can we not learn from that? It seems to me that in our society today as a whole that people seem not to want to do the right thing. They just don't seem to be concerned about what is right. Even in some of our congregations throughout the land. Man, there are things that's being uh, promoted. There are things that is total error. And I could just name you on my finger just things that I, just recently, that I've had discussions with people about. And what will we do? We don't turn a blind eye to it. We don't let it go. We don't sweep something underneath the rug. We do what Jesus did. Somebody says, but you're not Jesus. Absolutely not. But we have the same authority in the fact that we've got Scripture. Jesus quoted Scripture fulfill Scripture, and we have that in our hands. So when something is wrong, we can be filled with righteous indignation without using curse words, euphemisms, and acting in a way that would be displeasing to the Lord. Always do the right thing. It is amazing to me when you read this story, you read of a man that had all power, he had all authority, and he dealt with the situation, and he dealt with it in a way that pleased God, and they remembered later on what he said. And he did exactly what he said he would do. I hope the lesson has been beneficial to you tonight. If you have uh, any questions or comments, someone asked me, two or three people asked me, when we're having another question and answer, we're going to do that in a couple of weeks. Some of you may have some questions, you can turn those in. Uh, one of the questions that I was was asked recently, did Jesus sin when He did that? Well, the answer, of course, is not. Because Hebrews 4.15, Jesus tempted in all points like His weak, yet without sin. He who knew sin became sin that we may, may be made the righteous of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Jesus never sinned. So He did not sin in the story uh, that is recorded for us. But what He did do, He was filled with righteous indignation against people that had the wrong motive even in the temple area where they were coming in to worship. Brethren, we've got to make sure that what takes place in the foyer, what, might, what takes place in here, we always conduct ourselves in a way that is holy and right and that we have the right motive. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, 
Think about your soul. Would you tonight repent of your sins, confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Would you, with uh, your whole heart, being sorry for what you have done, and turn away from that sin and confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins? If you've done that and you just, man, you struggle, maybe you didn't handle a situation like Jesus did. Maybe you became angry that uh, it brought sin and reproach upon the Lord's church, upon the Lord's people. That needs to publicly be repented of. If we can help you in any way, would you come right now while together we stand as we sing?